A reading from 2 Corinthians chapters 4 and 5. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed we have a building from God a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. One of the great gifts of being almost 68 years old and having your final sabbatical is that you can read and write what you want. It's wonderful. And I found myself this spring during sabbatical um, moving more and more towards a book on stories of conversion. And of course, one of those stories has to be St. Paul. One of the books I'm reading right now I'm halfway through it, and I'm thoroughly enjoying it, I recommend it highly, is N.T. Wright's biography of Paul. And one of the reasons I like it is it, it tells the chronology of Paul's life, but as he's telling the story of Paul, he's in wherever Paul is, talking about the letters that he wrote. Now, it just so happens I finished the, the section where he would have written for Second Corinthians. And I don't think we always, or I didn't fully appreciate what Paul was undergoing when he wrote this letter. Now, I, if you know First and Second Corinthians, you know First Corinthians is kind of filled with all these pastoral problems that Paul is addressing. But it's, it's upbeat. He ends with the resurrection. I mean, there's a, there's a sense that things are going well in First Corinthians. Second Corinthians, however, there's a darkness. There's a darkness. And N.T. Wright even suggests that not only is Paul simply depressed, but he's thinking about giving it all up. Now, why is that? Well, he's in Ephesus, okay? And he's in Ephesus two and a half years, which is a long, long time, longest he's spent anywhere. And he started with the synagogues, and the synagogues, of course, you know, welcomed him like they always did, and then they turn on him. So he goes next door to uh, uh, the house of the, um, the proconsul. And he starts a Gentile mission church. And they're, you know, kind of filled with joy and they're kind of rocking and rolling with him. But then all of a sudden, as you know, towards the end, the Artemis of the Ephesians, I mean, he's got to leave. Um, somewhere in those two and a half years, probably towards the end, Paul hears distressing news from Corinth. And he takes a quick trip across the sea there to Corinth to consult with the problems that are there. And they don't even let him come in. Paul, the founder of the church, they, they don't even engage him. So with the tail between his legs, he heads back to Ephesus. And it's somewhere perhaps in that time period where the, the tension, you know, with the, the pagans in Ephesus is mounting. It looks like he's going to have to leave, you know, and the collapse of the church in Corinth. Paul writes 2 Corinthians. Now, 
here you can see, and, and you, you, you get it all the way through 2 Corinthians, where he, he has this up and down. He's, you can see he's just like us. He has good days and he has bad days. I think when he writes this, here at the end of chapter 4, beginning of 5, he's having a good day. And what is it that gives him hope? It's the resurrection. I love that, that we sing the resurrection song in the hymn, you know. I, I think it's the resurrection. He, he probably went back and read the 15th chapter of his first letter and said, this is why I do what I do. This is why I do what I do. And, you know, he talks about this light momentary affliction. You know, what is that? We don't know. I, I think it probably is, is depression. He is, he is struggling mentally with all the pressure that he's under. One of the things that Wright does that, you know, I think I understood, but I don't think I felt the full extent of it, is how absolutely, completely unique Paul's mission was. I mean, he's telling the Jews a story they'd never heard before. And then he's telling pagans a story that is like something that is, you know, like a, a tale from outer space. And yet he, he, is, he was bringing people to himself. He's creating church. And he's doing it in the midst of suffering. And so you can, you can sort of see as he writes, and you know there are two other letters to Corinth that we don't have, so we don't know what was in those. But here in this letter he says to them, so we do not lose heart. He's talking to himself. Yeah, don't lose heart, Corinthians, but I'm trying the best I can not to lose heart over what's happening to you and what looks like what's going to happen here in Ephesus. Is this really worth it? And he's, he's wearing down, you know. You can tell that, that this is affecting him physically. Our outer self is wasting away. And then he talks about the, the, this earthly home is destroyed, but we have this building with God. Here you can see that what keeps Paul going is his hope in the resurrection of the body. More and more in our postmodern world, I think that's what we need to confess, the resurrection of the body. Bodies that were created male and female, bodies that are loved by God no matter how flawed they are, bodies that are treasured by him whether they're born or unborn, bodies that are honored by God even when those bodies are rejecting him. And I think what Paul was struggling with is what we struggle with. When we get rejected, we want to run the other way. And Paul is trying to, to say to himself and the Corinthians and probably the Ephesians as well, let's not lose hope. Let's remember the resurrection. Let's remember that Christ has died and risen in a resurrected body that is a glimpse of our heavenly destiny. And in that hope of the resurrection, Paul is able to go on. One little footnote. I think I mentioned this in class, actually. Paul does go back to Corinth, and we don't know what happens. He does spend some time there, so they received him. I think I said he wants to go to Jerusalem from Corinth by boat, but some Corinthians had plotted a, a, a death threat against him, that if he got on that boat, he probably would have died. So he hightails it back north, overland. That's where he picks up Luke. And then when he's heading back to, down to Jerusalem, you know, just, just to give you an example of perhaps the kind of situation Paul finds himself, he, he can't go to Ephesus, I think. That's why he goes to Miletus and calls the elders to come to him, because there's trouble there. Where Paul goes, there's trouble. And really what that is saying to us is that where the gospel is preached in its truth and purity, there's going to be trouble. There's going to be affliction. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be um, moments of depression for us. 
I think we need to prepare ourselves for that. I think it's coming. Poor Ethan. Poor you guys in the SMP, young guys. It's, it's, but for, in my money, I'd love to be your age right now. What a great challenge. What a great opportunity. I think the gospel is going to flourish precisely because we're going to be persecuted for preaching the truth. And so I'll take this opportunity to thank you for a, a wonderful few days that we are joined together in that gospel and in the table in which Christ gives to us his very being and that we are always joined together, always, like Paul with this hope in the resurrection of the body, this knowledge, as he says, that the, the things seen are transient, but the things unseen are eternal. Even though I will not be with you physically, I am with you in Christ whenever the supper is celebrated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.